This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. As we briefly discussed at the end of our previous lecture together dealing with national insurance contributions, Chapter 12 introduces us to CGT, and very specifically here in Chapter 12.1, we look at the basis of computing a gain for an individual. And once we've calculated either a gain, or indeed a loss, there is no guarantee when you buy what you'll see in a moment's time as a chargeable asset, that you will at some future point be able to dispose of it, which principally means sell it, of course, there, for more than you paid for it, thus creating a chargeable gain. You might sell it for less and therefore have a loss. We have to see the situations in which such a gain or loss is to be computed. And if there's more than one transaction, as in any exam question, there will be within a tax year, because we are dealing with individuals for CGT, just like with income tax, we do a computation for a tax year. And for us, of course, that tax year will be the 21-22 tax year. And we'll establish, therefore, the overall net gains, probably net gains, but could be net losses, that arise for that tax year. If the gains that arise are bigger than the losses, so there is indeed a net gain, then the next phase of the problem, which will be principally the second lecture here in Chapter 12, that deals with the taxability of those gains. Now, there have been no changes over the last couple of years, either in Finance Act 2019 or Finance Act 20, to what we see now in Finance Act 2021, so far as the basic rules and application of those rules for CGT are concerned. But like with any of the taxes we've seen so far, there are rates and allowances issues. And those things do get updated, usually from one year to another. So I made a little note here of what we're going to be using for Chapter 12.1's lectures, the first here on CGT. And here in this first lecture, it's going to be partly taken from Finance Act of 2019, and partly from the Finance Act of 2020. As I say, the rules and the principles have not changed. But there is one thing here that has changed that is of relevance in this first lecture. And that is, for the extracts from the Finance Act of 2019 lecture, it will refer to, now there's a term that we briefly mentioned at the end of last time, I've abbreviated it to, as you will come to know and love it, as an AEA. That is our annual exempt amount. The clue's in the name. Annual for each tax year, exempt amount. It's just like our personal allowance. That gave you a level of tax-free income for each tax year to include on your income tax computation in terms of computing your taxable income. What will happen now in CGT, we will see that there is an annual exempt amount, a level of tax-free gains, that will be deducted in deriving what amount of net gain may then be chargeable to CGT. And although in this Finance Act year, our 21-22 tax year, we have an annual exempt amount of £12,300, which is exactly the same as we had last year, what there are are some elements of the Finance Act 2019 lecture, and that will refer to an, a a an AEA of £12,000, whereas for Finance Act 21 and 20, as I've said, the AEA equals 12,300. Now, as ever here, you will use your current Finance Act 21 study notes and go through the lecture in conjunction with the up-to-date notes with the up to date rates and allowances contained therein. But you will see examples used within the lecture, certainly one example anyway, where it does dip back into the Finance Act of 2019 presentation, and that was there we had that AEA of 12,000. The principles haven't changed, it's just that we would now be using 12,300 and not 12,000 pounds. Other than that, it is all indeed exactly the same. So, for the rest of the lecture, combination of both last year and the previous year's presentation. But just remember that when we look at a class example, the AEA to use now 
and to assume to have been used over all of the tax years concerned would be the current 12,300, not as it was in the Finance Act of 19, 12,000 pounds. Well, in our study so far, we focused on the taxation of income of the individual. Now, that taxation, of course, would be either income tax, that's the main charge to taxation on individuals, income tax, and we charge to tax all of the taxable income of the taxpayer. We built on Chapter 2, where we saw the framework of the computation, and then moved into the detail of each source of taxable income and how we would define it, and then assess it in relation to an income tax year. Two main sources of income that we saw were, of course, of earned income, employment income for the employed and for the self-employed, the trading profits of that unincorporated trader. And those types of income were subject, of course, in the previous chapter to a further charge to taxation, that being national insurance contributions. Well, now from Chapter 12, we turn our attention away from the taxability of income of the individual to the taxability of capital. Now, there are two capital taxes that we'll be seeing in our forthcoming studies, starting here with capital gains tax. Individuals are chargeable to capital gains tax. Now, where do we make, how do we make a capital gain? In essence, it's a very simple idea. I buy an asset, what we'll call in a moment's time a chargeable asset, for say £20,000. Some months or years later, I then sell that asset for £30,000. I've made a gain. Sales proceeds 30, less cost 20. I've got a gain of £10,000. And that gain, like with income, they will be recorded in relation to a tax year. We will bring together all of the gains of the tax year and then proceed to do a capital gains tax computation. It will derive for us a separate tax charge. The admin behind the tax systems we see in Chapter 15. And what we'll see now is that we have a separate chargeability to capital gains tax. It's a separate computation. Now, having stressed it's a separate computation, and it is, there will be, as we'll see very soon, a link between the two. In determining which of the relevant CGT rates to apply to our taxable gains of the tax year, we have to use as a basis for that the taxable income of the income tax computation. So although it is a totally separate computation, do not put capital gains on an income tax computation, there's a very essential link. Because without knowing the level of taxable income for the relevant tax year concerned, again for us that will be the 2019-20 tax year, but if we don't know the taxable income, we will not know the relevant CGT rate to apply to our various capital gains made for that particular tax year. And that is one of the big issues that we sort out within this particular chapter. So as an introductory sentence states here, individuals like you or I are subject to capital gains tax, which of course we'll know and love from now on as CGT, on their chargeable gains of the tax year. What we'll also discover, of course, is just like when you trade there's no guarantee that you'll always make a profit from trading. And equally, there's no guarantee that you'll always make a capital gain on the sale of an asset that just happens to be a chargeable asset. Assets have the, uh, a knack of going down in value as much as going up in value on occasions. Again, depending on events. Oh yes, events there. Um, in relation to that, therefore, each individual disposal will compute an individual gain or loss, bring all of that together for the tax year, remember the 1920 tax year, so disposals made between 6th of April 19 and 5th of April 20, and as we're most likely to see, we'll end up with an overall net gain. Depending on the level of that gain, we can then work out the taxability, but the tax rates will be partly a function of the level of taxable income that we had off the income tax computation. So there's a link between the two. As we'll talk about in each of these chapters, especially in this first introductory chapter, when you're doing objective testing questions, as you will be in section A and section B, where you'll see indeed CGT probably being tested in both of those sections, you've got to be oh so careful in terms of 
making sure you've properly understood the real requirement of the question. Don't answer what you think has been asked. Answer the question that has actually been asked. And I'll talk you through the typical errors that students make in the hope, of course, that you will then seek to avoid those errors when you practice and then when you go into the examination room. So individuals are subject to capital gains tax on what will be their net overall taxable gains of the tax year. We've not yet dealt with corporation tax, though we've made references to it. But the chargeable gains of a company are included on the company's corporation tax computation along with its taxable income. So whereas we have just made the specific point for individuals that we have a separate income tax computation and a separate CGT computation, there are no such separations when it comes to corporate tax. A company is chargeable to corporation tax, well, a UK resident company anyway, on its worldwide income and gains. So we'll be able to record, we'll see it in chapter 16, what would be both the taxable income of the company for a given accounting period and also the taxable gains. Put it together to derive what we'll call the overall taxable total profits of the company. That's what you can see here in the notes to get the company's overall taxable total profits. That is the figure on a corporate tax computation that we'll firstly seek to compute. Like with the income tax computation, it came in two parts. The income tax computation, we computed firstly the figure of taxable income. Once we got the taxable income, we moved to the second part. That, of course, being the calculation of the income tax liability based upon that figure of taxable income. So it is in corporate tax. We will initially compute taxable total profits, which you now know will include both the taxable income and the taxable gains of the company's so-called accounting period. And all of that will then be subjected to corporation tax. And as I said, we will see that in chapter 16 of our notes. A chargeable gain or allowable loss arises on. Now here's a very important term or definition here of how we would derive a capital gain. For a gain, or indeed a loss to arise, there must be a chargeable disposal of a chargeable asset by a chargeable person there. And each of those terms are defined specifically on this page. You'll see just a little bit further down, chargeable disposal, chargeable assets, and down at the bottom of the page, chargeable person. And we'll come to that in a moment. And that underpins all of the calculations we go on to do. It's a basic given statement. It's one that should be quick and easy for us to learn and to understand. In fact, it probably has more relevance, strangely, when and if you ever move to advanced taxation, where again, we have to talk about planning issues rather more than just computational issues. And the concept of what gives rise to a capital gain becomes a very important communication point to explain to your client that a chargeable gain arises where there is a chargeable disposal of a chargeable asset by a chargeable person. But more of that later. But how do we calculate that gain? Well, it was a simple exercise, as we said. The individual bought a chargeable asset, as now we'll call it, for £20,000, and at a later future point in time, sold it for 30000 very clearly there, we can see that there is a gain of £10,000. That basic calculation ha has to be modified slightly for certain issues, as we'll now talk about. As this note says, the basic calculation of the gain is a simple one. Deducting the allowable costs of an asset from its net proceeds upon its sale. A company, we mentioned about companies being chargeable to corporation tax on their chargeable gains. That is our later studies, but mention it at this point. A company, not an individual, that concerns us now, may then further reduce any gain for the effects of inflation by the deduction of something called indexation allowance, a relief for the effects of inflation and the details of which 
you will find within chapter 19. That's coming up, of course, much later in our studies. Even there, as we will then discover, that relief for the effects of inflation has been frozen back at December 2017. So if companies bought assets like individuals have bought assets post December 17, then there wouldn't be any indexation allowance. Again, the calculation of the gain for the company would be the same as that for the individual. What do we sell it for? What are our net sale proceeds? And deduct from that our allowable costs. Let's just have a quick look over the page now at that basic calculation. I see just a couple of other things, as I mentioned a moment ago, coming into this. So here we've got the basic calculation of a gain or loss that needs to be done for each and every chargeable disposal of a chargeable asset by a chargeable person within the tax year. Again, in essence, it's simple. We start with our disposal proceeds. Now, again, that will sound, I hope, very obvious, whatever you have sold that asset for. What we'll discover it later when we look at the definition of chargeable disposal, indeed, in just a few minutes time, we'll look at that. A chargeable disposal could occur by means other than simply selling an asset, which you may find surprising. But yes, a chargeable disposal may arise, as we'll see in the notes in a moment, with don't you just you sell it. But if you were to give the asset away, or even if it was lost or destroyed. So that sets up its own issues. In those circumstances, there may not be any or indeed sufficient sale proceeds. So how do you go about calculating again? Don't worry, it's a very simple exercise. The question will tell you the market value of that asset. But disposal proceeds should, in the vast majority of circumstances you see, be your sales proceeds. But when you sell an asset, you may incur selling expenses. You put something in an auction. There's commission to be paid to the auctioneer. You sell a property. There are agents' fees. There are legal expenses that you incur. So there will be normal selling expenses that you incur, and these are allowable deductions against the sale proceeds of that asset. We'll see examples of that as we go through our studies. And that will bring you down to what we'll call our net proceeds. We then deduct what we say here, costs. Now, clearly, there will be an original allowable cost when first you bought that particular asset, an original cost. And for, in most circumstances, that's the only cost that you will have incurred. But sometimes with assets, you will go on and incur what we'll call enhancement expenditure. Enhancement expenditure. You have enhanced the value of that asset. I bought a property for investment purposes. I then added an extension to that property, obviously to enhance the value as well as the better use of the property. That extension cost, I put a garage on, I put a conservatory on, I built some extra rooms, whatever. Those costs are allowable costs. And just like the original cost incurred when purchased, will be allowable deductions at the point of sale. So take away all of our costs and you will get, well, hopefully, and it will be the case in most circumstances in an exact question, you will have net proceeds bigger than the total of allowable costs. And therefore, you will have a capital gain. If, of course, sadly, as will be the case in the odd circumstance that you see, you incur more costs than you have net proceeds, then a capital loss arises. What we'll then do, of course, as we'll see soon, is to bring all of those gains and losses together for our normal set time period for an individual, the tax year, 6th of April to 5th of April, and establish the net over all gains. Depending on the level of those net gains, we'll then proceed to compute the taxable gains and then proceed to tax those taxable gains where we, as we mentioned earlier, must see a link back to the taxable income of the income tax computation. So we know which of the relevant capital gains tax rates to then apply. 
As we mentioned a moment ago, individuals do not get indexation allowance on disposals. Individuals do not get any relief for the effects of inflation. So yeah, I bought that asset for £20,000 10 years ago. I sell it now for £30,000. Well, £20,000 10 years ago may be worth what is £30,000 now. So there may be no real gain that I have made if I took account of the effects of inflation there. Well, that's the way it goes. There is no relief for the effects of inflation. It is a straight comparison of what are your net proceeds of sale and what is the total of all of your allowable costs over the period of ownership of that asset. What individuals do get, however, to compensate them for this, and companies do not, individuals do benefit from an annual exempt amount, or AEA, as we'll go on to abbreviate, abbreviate that from now on, our annual exempt amount, which you said is not available to companies. And that is just like what we saw in an income tax computation. We listed out all the taxable income of the taxpayer for the tax year. Now we list out all of the net gains of the taxpayer for the tax year. But the net income was not the taxable income. What did we take away from that? The personal allowance, that level of tax-free income that every UK resident would be eligible for, for the tax year. We took that away. Again, as long as the figure of income was bigger than the personal allowance, we deducted the full available personal allowance. If, of course, your income was only £10,000, therefore lower than the £12,500 personal allowance, then the taxable income would be zero. The personal allowance big enough to reduce the income figures down to zero there but any unused personal allowance would be lost. The equivalent now for capital gains is this, the AEA, the annual exempt amount, a level of tax-free gains that each of us as taxpayers have available to us, and that extends to every individual. So just like in income tax, each spouse there or civil partner had available a personal allowance, well, each individual has available an AEA. If we don't use all of that AEA in any tax year, you lose it. It's the same premise as a personal allowance. Use it or lose it. You don't get to carry forward any of these unused amounts. Each tax year has its own AEA. Use it or lose it within that tax year. What, of course, we may see to further reduce gains of a year, if we had, for a particular tax year, more losses than gains, we'd end up with a net loss overall for the tax year. There'd be no CGT, obviously, to pay because you've made a net loss in that tax year. But what you can then be able to do is to carry forward that net capital loss to put against future chargeable gains. And again, we'll be coming back to this section just at the top of this page in a moment, which is where, having calculated each individual gain, each individual loss, using the method that you see here, we bring all those individual figures together and then attempt to put it into a CGT computation. OK, let's just go to back to the first introductory page on CGT. And we there defined what there needed to be for a chargeable gain to arise. There had to be a chargeable disposal of a chargeable asset by a chargeable person. Right, let's look at those terms now as they are defined here. A chargeable disposal, now of course it will usually occur by the sale of an asset. That's how most people chargeably dispose of any chargeable assets they sell them. But will also arise when an asset is gifted. Now that is a hugely important one so far as our uh, syllabus is concerned. And indeed for those of you who go on to uh, advanced taxation becomes probably even more important there. But it's a big big issue because what you are now thinking is well 
Hang on a minute, that's not fair. Oh, the F word used again there, fair. No, what we have is a situation is if you chargeably dispose, sell or gift a chargeable asset and you are a chargeable person, then a capital gain must be computed on that chargeable disposal. And the fact that there are no sales proceeds is not a barrier to the calculation of any gain or indeed loss that may have arisen there. What you use is an open market value. Those open market values will be provided to you so far as any examination question is concerned. So we must compute a gain or loss based on market value. Now, as I said, would be a really important communication exercise. Now, at Tax UK level, this introductory level in terms of taxation, we're far more interested in the calculations, the computations. Right, a taxpayer gave away this asset to his daughter. At the point of gift, it was worth £20,000. That's your disposal consideration there. And you compute a gain based upon that particular market value. So it's a very simple calculation. You're just substituting a given market value for what would otherwise have been sale proceeds. But of course, then there's the communication issue to your client, which, as I said, actually becomes more of an important at a higher level. Or potentially, in terms of nowadays, as we mentioned in our introductory lectures, we've got section C, where we find there's a 10 mark question. And though it doesn't always have to be this, frequently it's a tax planning situation. So we get a little bit of a sample of what you go on to do in advanced taxation should you choose to pick up on that uh, particular paper in the future. You'd have to explain to your client that in relation to his request for information about making various gifts of assets to family members, about what, if anything, would be the tax position. So our first starting point for that would be to say that there are capital taxes that need to be dealt with, the first of which and immediate one that needs to be dealt with is CGT. Why is CGT relevant? Because a gift of an asset represents a chargeable disposal. And therefore, if of a chargeable asset and the individual is a chargeable person, then a gain must be computed based on, and of course they then give it to you, the market value of that asset. That then begets other issues. You may then think, but hang on a minute, it still doesn't sound fair. You've given something away. You are worse off, not better off. This is exactly what makes it such an important communication issue, because your client would have probably no idea that the fact that he intended or she intended now to give assets away to various family members could ever impose any tax issues. Most individuals think, I only pay tax when I make some money, whether it's income or whether I sell something and now make a capital gain. Well, no. The definition for CGT, as we keep saying, is chargeable disposal of chargeable asset by a chargeable person. So we know how to deal with it. We calculate the normal gain, but based now on market value. But it still sounds harsh because you didn't receive anything. And that's where one of the so-called reliefs that we deal with in a hugely important and very substantial chapter that will be coming up soon, chapter 14, there is a relief that may, not will, be appropriate to that situation. Now then, we're not very creative as accountants, us, especially as taxation folk, in terms of our naming. So we need a name for a relief that deals with a gift. Hmm, tricky, eh? Gift relief is in order. And all it will simply allow for is that the gain computed based on the market value we will allow in the case of a gift relief claim. A gift relief claim has to be available here that we discuss in chapter 14. But if it is available, if this particular disposal, 
this particular asset is eligible for gift relief. It will allow the gain that we've now computed based on the donor, the person who has made the gift, it allows that gain to be deferred. Not exempted, we're never going to exempt here in this situation, we are simply going to allow a deferral. We'll accept the fact that, okay, you didn't get any cash at this point, you gave it away. So we'll still compute the gain based on market value, but we'll allow you to defer that gain. Now, of course, chapter 14 will tell us the way by which that gain is deferred. That is not for now. And that just refers to this little sentence here, just above, as I just itemise that in the notes, on the notes in front of you. Qualifying gains, note qualifying gains, may then be eligible for certain reliefs that will allow such gains, or sometimes parts thereof, to be either exempted from tax, which is most unusual, but there is one relief that will allow for that. And, as we say here more commonly, deferred from immediate chargeability to tax. Well, you now know one of the principal deferral reliefs, at least by name. Not by method of computation, but by name. That is gift relief that will be available to us. So, Coming back to the definition of chargeable disposal. When an asset is gifted, lost, or even destroyed. Now, of course, if we lose it or it's destroyed, the gains to then arise, where is money coming in from? Or well, basically, insurance. If there are insurance proceeds, then that is going to feed into a capital gains calculation, as we'll see a wee bit later in our studies. There is, however, no chargeable disposal upon the death of the taxpayer. There you go. If you want uh, to give your client a bit of, uh, <laughs> I'm going to say good advice, I say advice rather than good, about how to avoid capital gains tax. Die. Very simple. All you've got to do, therefore, is die. Leave all your assets to whoever you have chosen to uh, gift them to the beneficiaries of your estate, as we'll know it, and those assets will pass free of any capital gains tax over to the next generation or whoever it is you've chosen to give them to. And what is more, they'll transfer to those individuals at their then market value. Now that's relevant to us in the context of we spoke a moment ago about how to calculate a basic capital gain net proceeds, less allowable costs. We've now seen in the discussion so far that when you dispose of an asset, there may not be any proceeds. It may be gifted away. No problem. We use a given market value. What about costs? Well, that's what we paid for it when we bought it, what we've incurred as an enhancement expenditure during the period of ownership. But of course, what might have happened is it might have been gifted to you. It might have been left to you on, sadly, the death of another individual. It was a bequest to you, the beneficiary, in which case you acquire it at its then market value. So all accrued gains on the period of the ownership of the individual who's died and left that asset to you, all those gains disappear from the taxation system. They have not been tasked, taxed, charged to CGT. They won't ever be charged to CGT. They then go to the beneficiaries at their then probate value, which is the market value at the date of the death of the taxpayer. Right. Now, you might think, well, that seems like a good idea there. But apart from one small problem, and that is that the donor has died. But... Though you are free at that point from CGT, uh, you're free of a lot of other things like life, of course, as well there, but you're free of CGT, sadly, HMRC have got another tax, of course, that deals with the content of your, and again, that's an unfortunate name here, chargeable estate at death. Chargeable. Mm, that implies chargeable to tax. The tax now, well, can you remember our introductory lectures? 
What tax do you think will be charged on the death of the individual? There are two capital taxes, CGT that deals with lifetime disposals, and then of course we've got IHT that, as well as dealing with lifetime disposals, more about that in our later chapter on IHT, but it will also of course pick up, and the main part of IHT picks up, the chargeable estate at the date of death of the taxpayer. That will be chargeable to inheritance tax at an inheritance tax rate that when you go above, start to begin with a very friendly rate, a nil rate of tax. But when that nil rate band has been used up, you go to 40%. That is a very substantial charge to IHT. So there are two capital taxes, CGT that we deal with in lifetime, an IHD that is principally arising, certainly so far as our exam is concerned, as a result of the death of the taxpayer. But more of that in our later chapter on IHT. Uh, again, only one chapter, but a very, very substantial chapter, as we will see. But more of that for the future. OK, so as we've just said, assets on death will pass free of CGT to the beneficiaries at their then market or probate value. And as I just said, sadly, although there's no CGT that arises upon death, we have got a chargeability to inheritance tax that may arise. And that awaits us in Chapter 24. Right. Chargeable disposal. On to chargeable assets. Very simple definition of chargeable assets. All assets are chargeable unless they are specifically exempted. Now, there are a number of exempt assets, not usually mounting up to uh, huge amounts. But again, these are the ones that you need to know. These are the important ones. First of all, and the most common one, motor vehicles suitable for private use. Basically, motor cars there. Motor vehicles suitable for private use. Those are exempt assets. Now, again, this is not some generous uh, move on part of HMRC. If an asset is a chargeable asset, then we would have to compute either a gain or a loss on that disposal made by the individual taxpayer. So have a wild guess at this one. If I bought a car three years ago for £20,000, is it going to be worth £20,000 or is it going to be worth more than £20,000 now? No, it isn't. It is going to be significantly lower in value. So if I bought it for £20,000, it now might be worth £12,000. Do you now see the method in the madness of HMRC? This exemption of motor vehicles is not some generous act upon their part, it's a purely selfish act, which of course is to ensure that they do not allow millions and millions of taxpayers each tax year an allowable loss in relation to disposal of their car. That's why it's exempted. And it's the case in many of these situations in terms of what they choose to exempt, because those are the disposals that are most likely to give rise to losses. Again, what do examiners do? They try to, I'm going to say trick there. They don't try to trick. Examiners give you enough rope by which to hang yourself there. Don't take it. So what do you get? You get in an example that it is the disposal of a vintage car. It doesn't matter. Vintage mean very old, a collector's piece there. It doesn't matter. If it is a car that is suitable for private use, whether used a lot for private purposes or not, it doesn't matter. So whether it's just your normal everyday car or it's an investment in terms of a vintage car there, it's a car and therefore motor vehicles suitable for private use are exempt. So don't get caught on that one. Something we saw back in uh, chapters two and three in terms of an exemption from income tax, the holding of national savings and investment certificates free of both income and CGT. 
foreign currency for private use. In the game between <coughs> acquiring the foreign currency and then maybe converting it back into uh, sterling, if the exchange rates have changed, such as on the amount that you've cashed back in for sterling that you haven't spent while well on your holidays, you make a bit of a gain there, then that is going to be exempt. Again, foreign currency for private use, that is going to be exempt. Decorations awarded for bravery there. Yeah, if there are medals that were awarded to brave for bravery to an individual or to an individual and now their son or daughter or grandchild has got that. Where it was originally awarded for bravery and has again come through the family, we have a situation where that would be viewed as being right to exempt that particular disposal from capital gains tax. What doesn't get exempted is if you are a collector, you go out and you buy these things and the value goes up, you sell, you make a capital gain. There, that's not awarded to you for bravery. It's not particularly brave walking into the antique shop under enemy fire, no doubt, on the high street there and buying this particular medal and then being able to sell it at a profit at a later point in time. So decorations awarded for bravery, yep, that's fine. But if you're just buying and selling, no. Any damages for personal injury that are received, the products of life insurance policies, works of art given for national use. Now, those I've quickly glossed over because you're not going to see those except on a very irregular basis. But the next one, guilt edge securities. Yeah, we need to know that one. What do we mean by guilt edged? These are government securities. And a typical one you see in an exam question would be something called exchequer stock. Government securities, they are exempt. As two are a different security, qualifying corporate bonds. Basically, corporate loan stock, a debenture, for example, there, but corporate loan stock. Again, any profits or losses on disposals will be exempt. Really important one, so far as our exam is concerned, the one most tested, other than motor vehicles up there, certain chattels. Now there's a word, and then a very old fashioned word indeed, chattels. Tangible, movable property. Tangible, movable property, such as antiques. So you've got various family heirlooms there, some antiques. Those are going to be exempt in certain circumstances. Certain chattels, in certain circumstances. Now again, we've got a separate note on this later in the chapter where we'll identify what those certain chattels are and what those certain circumstances are going to be. As you may guess, there's going to be a de minimis limit, a minimum level, that at which point, if you go above that, then you're going to get face chargeability. That cut off figure in terms of chargeability is £6,000. If you're able to sell for more than £6,000, it ceases to be exempt. If you were to buy for £2,000, sell for £5,000, each of your cost and your sales proceeds are below £6,000, then the chattel exemption would apply. But don't worry about trying to note that down or remember that, that at this point in time. We have a separate section. But when we come to it, hence why we have a separate section, it's an important one. It is the most likely exemption that is going to be tested. Not simply because either something is or is not exempt. What we'll discover with that one is that you might have a sort of partial exemption. Some of the gain or some of the loss may be exempted rather than all of that gain or loss. It makes it a more interesting calculation and that attracts your examiner. Again, as we saw in uh, income tax, investments held in an ISA there, an individual savings account. 
chargeable person, well, that's very basic, going back to a term that we referred to in chapter two. An individual who is resident in the UK, a UK resident, is a chargeable person and is therefore liable on their worldwide assets. Now, this is a very basic definition for Tax UK. If again, you go on to look at advanced taxation in your future studies, if you choose that at the professional stage, then that's going to be rather more complex in terms of dealing with the residence of a taxpayer and the consequences of UK or non-UK residents. All you need to know here is if we've satisfied our tests of UK residents, though those were tests that we used for income tax purposes, if, as you will be dealing with a UK resident, then that is a chargeable person. OK, so we know, therefore, that individuals are subject to CGT on chargeable disposal of a chargeable asset by a chargeable person. The fact that we may not always have sale proceeds or sufficient proceeds to represent its market value, no problem. A chargeable disposal is not just a sale, it's a gift, it's a loss, it's a destruction of an asset and market values may therefore be used in those circumstances. The basic computation itself, as we saw, for each individual asset Disposal proceeds, disposal consideration, proceeds less selling expenses there. To get net proceeds, take away any and all allowable costs and get either a gain or a loss. And you do that for each and every chargeable asset that has been chargeably disposed of within your tax year. And what we then look at is the CGT computation which is as far as we'll take this particular discussion in terms of this particular session. So what does it look like? It's a listing exercise, aren't all computations that. We've got our capital gains made during the tax year. We will deduct any capital losses that were made in the year. And that should give us, I'm assuming it will be, our net chargeable gains in the tax year. Our net gains. If there were losses, those net losses would then be able to be carried forward for relief against future gains. How those losses then brought forward are used, you'll see on this computation in just a moment's time. So we get the net gains of the year, netting out the gains and losses. We then deduct our AEA, remember? What does that stand for? Our annual exempt amount. That, it's on your fact sheet, but you will need to look that up by the time you're doing the exam. That's a figure of some £12,000. When we've taken away those, uh, or that AEA, probability is that for the vast majority of tax taxpayers, that then becomes the taxable gain. But one other possibility that now we see is that there may be capital losses brought forward from an earlier tax year. As I just said, if for this tax year we made more losses than gains, we carry forward that net loss into the next tax year. And if it's not used then, we keep carrying forward. There's no time limit on the carry forward of these losses for individuals. They keep going forward until such time as they meet gains or, of course, until we die. So, get your net gains of the year, take away your AEA, then, if there are any, deduct your capital losses brought forward. Now, clearly, what we may have is, having already deducted AEA, the amount of gains post the deduction of AEA may be smaller than the amount of capital losses brought forward, in which case, fine. If you've got here a figure of £5,000 of net gains post AEA and your capital losses brought forward have been £12,000, well, you'll just use sufficient to bring, of course, your taxable gains down to nil. That would mean you've used 5000 out of 12000 therefore the 7,000 
to carry forward to the future. So having got the taxable gain, it's then a question of the relevant CGT rate. And as you'll discover here, and these rates of course provided to you on your rates and allowances page given to you in the examination, you'll be talking about 10% or 20%, 18% or 28%. Now, what you have there is clearly a lower and a higher rate. The difference between those low and higher rates, though the rates themselves are different, the difference is the same. It's a 10 percentage difference. Now, remember I told you right at the outset of this lecture that although we did a separate capital gains tax computation for the taxpayer, separate that is, from his or her income tax computation, what there is, is an important link. And that links back to the level of taxable income. And the key issue in terms of your income tax computation is whether you are or are you are not a higher rate taxpayer. Whether or not you're a higher rate taxpayer or you're still a basic rate taxpayer. Because taking your taxable income on your income tax computation as a threshold, we are then able to use the lower rates. Now, again, what you apply them to, we will talk about later, 10% or 18% to any amounts of the relevant gains that fall still within the available basic rate band. But then any gains that go above your available basic rate band, basic rate band, remember, in terms of taxable income for the normal individual, £37,500. But if you go up into higher rate, what was 10% becomes a 20% rate. What was 18% becomes a 28% rate there. Last bit of the exercise that may be required of you like it is with every taxation. What is chargeable to tax? That's your taxable gains here. Then calculate your tax on it using the relevant rates. And the last thing that your client wants to know is, OK, that is how much tax needs to be paid. When do I have to pay that tax? And that, very simple, a standard due date, which is the 31st of January, following the end of the tax year. So the 1920 tax year ends on the 5th of April 20. What is the 31st of January following? That, of course, is the 31st of January 21. OK, now I've only spoken very briefly there about the application of those rates. Don't worry, what we'll do is uh, we'll call this uh, session uh, to a halt at this point in time. And at the beginning of our next session, I'll give you some examples to discuss through. So again, have a quick recap in terms of the concepts that we've covered over this particular session. And then we'll move forward to actually do these calculations and work out a CGT liability based on the taxable gains of the taxpayer for the tax year. And then the taxable income of the taxpayer for the tax year so that we can then work out which particular CGT rates are to be imposed upon those taxable gains.